Okay, so now that we've talked about what instruments actually are and how you can make sure they're good, um, we need to talk about how to actually use them in practice. And what we mean when we say um, using an instrument splits the policy into the exogenous part and the endogenous part. We've been mentioning that, but it actually means something statistically and numerically. So let's look at that. Um, so if we go back to this model here, we have the effect of education on earnings. If we don't adjust for ability or any of the other confounders, then we find that education causes your wages to increase by $13 an hour, but that is wrong. Um, if we adjust for ability, then we find that the true effect is like $7.77 an hour. But notice how the name of this model is forbidden. Um, that's because we can't actually run this regression. We don't have, in real life, a column named ability. In the example code that is on the website, there is a column called ability, and that's just so you can see how it works behind the scenes. But this is kind of the forbidden model. You can't actually run this thing. Um, so what we want to do, this is our goal. We want to do something with regression that will get us close to $7.70-ish cents. Um, because that is the true causal effect. We don't know that in real life, um, but because this is fake data, we know it because we have the ability column. So this is the mechanics of, of the instrumental variable approach that we, we talked about in a, a couple sections ago, where we have education here. We want to split that into the exogenous part of education and the endogenous part of education, which then means we can throw away this endogenous stuff count that as part of the error in the model, and all we're left with is the exogenous part of education and its effect on earnings. So that's our goal, is to somehow only get the exogenous part of education. So we need to get a special version of the education column for this to work. Um, before you do any of this fancy regression stuff to get the, the special version of education that is purely exogenous, what you need to do is make sure your proposed instrument meets these requirements. It has to be relevant, it has to be excludable, and it has to be exogenous. Um, so you can actually check all of that using stats. Um, so for relevancy, the goal here is you want to see if there's a relationship between the program and the instrument. So if education is explained by father's education in this case, because that's our proposed instrument. So does father's education cause the program to happen? So you can do that by running a regression model. So here we have a column called father's education. We're going to say education is explained by father's education. Um, this is the fake data set that we have with the father's education data set here. And if we look at the results, we don't really care so much about the actual estimate. What this really means is for every year of education your father has, that is associated with um, a 0.9 year increase in your education. So there is, they're, they're related. If you look at this plot here, as father's education goes up, your education goes up, cool. And it is statistically significant. If you look at the p-value here, it's showing it as zero. That's really like 0 0.0000001. So that is very significant, which means it is relevant. That is a, there's a strong relationship between father's education and your education. Another more formal way of testing to see if it's relevant is to look at what is called the F statistic for the model. And you may have learned this in your past stats classes. What an F statistic is, is it measures basically the joint significance of all of the parts of the model. Um, if you have lots of coefficients or if you just have one coefficient, do all of those coefficients together explain the variation in y. And if so, then that's good. Um, so the way you find the f statistic with r is you use this glance function, which we've been using to look at r squared, for instance. So if you look at this model's r squared, that's 0.87. That's really, really high. Again, that's because this is totally fake data. Um, but if you look at the statistic column here, that is the f statistic. Um, and the general guideline for this, for instrumental variables, um, as you read in the book, um, is 10. If the F statistic is bigger than 10, then that's generally a sign that it is relevant. Um, but um, there was a paper that came out in October 2020 um, that, again, if you press P on your keyboard here, if you're following along with the slides, you'll see in the presenter view there's a link to this paper here. 
Um, and what this paper finds is that the whole guideline of using 10 as um, kind of a measure of, of a good F statistic isn't actually good. Um, it's too weak of a number. And what they find is that 104.7 is kind of the magic threshold number you should be looking at. But even they say like, it's not a magical number. It's not like if you have 103, that's gonna be a weak instrument and 105, it's suddenly strong. Basically their guideline is look for big numbers. Um, so look for something bigger than 100 or 104 or bigger. Um, and that will show kind of relevance of the instrument. So in this case, 7,136 is definitely bigger than 104. So we can say that that is a strong, relevant instrument. So that's good. Next, we need to talk about exclusion, um, which is the tricky part here. This is where you have to tell stories. You can do some stats. You can look at um, the relationship between father's education, which is the instrument, and earnings. And that is positive. It's probably significant there, um, which kind of helps us. But really, the story we need to be able to tell is, does father's education here cause earnings only through education? So father's education can't go to any other node to lead to earnings. And if it does, then it doesn't meet the exclusion restriction or the exclusion principle. Um, so that's tricky because you can probably think of lots of nodes. Kind of most obvious is um, father's education causes father's education increase. And then that, or father's education causes father's earnings to increase. And then father's earnings probably causes your earnings to go up. Um, we just broke the exclusion principle. Oh, well. Um, there's probably a whole host of other nodes that um, lead between father's education and earnings that aren't education. So you just have to think of those things. Um, we're just going to pretend that it is exclusive. Sure. Um, finally, we need to check for exogeneity. So is assignment to your parents random? Yeah, um, you didn't have any choice over like who your parents were. So that's totally outside like if you look back at the node here, there's no other nodes leading to kind of your father's education, except um, is your parents' choice to gain education random? Are there any other nodes that might lead into that instrument there? And probably, yeah, um, there's probably a ton of reasons why your father got specific levels of education um, that are related to these unmeasured confounders. So your ability doesn't cause father's education, but the city you live in, the year you were born in, the year your father was born in, there's a whole bunch of other red nodes up here that you can't measure that cause father's education there. Um, and so that breaks the exogeneity idea, but we'll pretend that it works because 20 years ago, people pretended it works. Okay, so we checked those things. We checked relevancy, excludability, and exogeneity. So with those three things, we can then finally do the magical splitting into endogeneity and exogeneity. So the way you do this is through something called two-stage least squares regression, or 2SLS is how it's um, abbreviated. What this means is we need to find the exogenous part of the policy variable based on the instrument, and then we use that to predict the outcome. So we already talked about the education. We want to split that into the exogenous part and the endogenous part. And then we want to use just the, the special exogenous version of education to then explain wages. So we need to split education into two different parts and keep one of the parts. So that is what two stage least squares lets us do. In the first stage, your goal is to predict education based on the instrument. So we're going to say, here's all of these different rows in this data set. We're going to predict each person's education based on their father's education and based on the instrument, what is the person's level of education. And this creates something called education hat. Notice that hat sign there. That is just the predicted values, um, predicted education based on the instrument. This education hat variable, it's a column that we create in the data set, that is the exogenous part of education. Um, that is what we can then use in the second stage to estimate the effect of education on earnings. But notice here, before we were saying just beta one education, 
Now it's beta one education hat. We're no longer looking at the actual level of education for each of the people in the data set. We're looking at predicted levels of education based on the instrument. And then whatever coefficient we get here, this beta one here, that is going to be the causal effect of education on earnings because of the instrument. Okay, so that's the two stage thing. We use the first stage to generate predicted education, and then we use those predictions as the special exogenous part of education. So this right here is education, just the exogenous part. We got rid of the endogeneity because of the instrument. Okay, so what this looks like with our code here, you do a first stage model where you're predicting education based on father's education. Um, we already saw this model um, where if your father's education goes up one year, then yours goes up by 0.9 years. Sure, we don't actually care so much about the details of that first stage. You can also check the instrument strength. Um, so again, this is checking the F statistic, which is this number right there, should be big. Um, books will still say greater than 10, but really it should just be a big number. Um, then you use that first stage to predict the policy. So notice here, remember regression, what it lets us do is it gives us a magical formula where if we know somebody's father's education, we can plug that in. Let's say somebody's father got 20 years of education. We can say 20 times 0.916 plus the intercept, plus 2.25. And that will be predicted education for somebody with um, whose father had 20 years of education. So we can do this, we already did this kind of with propensity scores when we talked about inverse probability weighting, where you take um, columns in the data set and plug it into the formula. So here's our formula for generating education hat. We have the intercept, we have the slope, times years of father's education. Um, so we can use the augment columns function in R to do that. And so what that gives us is, here's the original data set with wage, education, ability, father's education, but we have a new column here called education hat, or educ hat. And what this represents is plugging in these values. So we're saying father's education, this person 17.2 was their father's years of education. So if we plug that 17.2 into our formula and say 0.916 times 17.2 plus the intercept equals 18 years of education is what that person should, is predicted to have. Um, if we look at the second person here, their father had 15 and a half years of education, so plug that into the formula. Um, so whatever 0.916 times 15.5 plus 2.251 is 16.4. And you do that throughout all of the whole data set. That's what Augment Columns does for you. And so this right here is the exogenous part of education. Um, it's not always going to be the same as observed education. So this person had 18 and a half years. According to the model, they should have had 18. Cool. Um, look at this person here. They had 17.3. According to the model, they should have had only 15. Neat. Um, when we did inverse probability weighting, we could measure like how off those things were, and we made weights based on how weird they were. We're not doing anything like that here. We're just saying this is the exogenous part of education. So any differences here between like 17.3 and 15, that's because of ability. That's because of other unmeasured confounders that are kind of changing this person's level of education. But this is purely the exogenous part of it. So now that we have education hat as a column, we can use that in the second stage. So the second stage here, this is our outcome, wage. We're going to say wage is explained by education hat, not education anymore. This is just the special version of education that is purely exogenous. And then if you look at the results, this is the causal effect, where one year of education causes your wage to go up by $7.83 an hour. And we can talk about causation because we got rid of the endogeneity in education by using the instrument. So if we compare them all here, Here's our original unadjusted um, equation here, 13.12, that's wrong. Um, this is our forbidden model where we adjust for ability, but we can't actually do that. We don't have an ability column. But if we do this two-stage least squares regression and we use father's education as an instrument, 
notice how close that is. This is 7.83. The true value is like 7.77. That is close. That's really actually pretty cool. Um, this is purely observational data. There's no um, uh, experiments or anything here. There's no treatment group, no control group. But we were able to find the causal effect of education on earnings um, using that instrument. Um, in this case, it works because it's all fake data. In real life, father's education doesn't really work that well, but we're pretending it does. Um, but that's basically the process you go through. We did the first stage to generate education hat based on the instrument. And then we used education hat in the second stage um, to estimate the effect. Pure, uh, so this is the purely exogenous effect of education on earnings. And it works. So a couple other things you can do with instrumental variables. You can actually use multiple instruments to um, explain more of the endogeneity in the policy. So if we look at education causing earnings, this DAG got flipped for some reason. So pretend it's on the other side here, or just read it backwards. Um, so here this is saying that your mother's education causes your level of education. Your father's education also causes your level of education. Each of the instruments has to meet the requirements of a good instrument. So you have to make sure it's relevant. So we need to make sure that mother's education cause, has a strong relationship with education and has a high F statistic, probably does. Um, it still needs to meet the exclusion restriction. So that means mother's education causes your earnings only because of education, which there's probably a billion other reasons why that's wrong. Um, and then the exogeneity um, restriction means that all of these red nodes here do not connect to mother's education which again, probably not the case, but we'll pretend. So if you're going to do that, you include both of the instruments in the first stage here, where you say um, education hat is um, based on father's education and mother's education. Um, and then you use that education hat here to then predict earnings. And this is going to be the causal effect, this beta one right there. Um, so that's how you use multiple instruments. You stick the instruments here in the first stage and then um, use the predicted education in earnings. Um, in the machine learning world, um, there are some approaches to, um, to like artificial intelligence where they use instrumental variables, but they just throw in like a thousand different instruments and they see what sticks. Um, and sometimes the instruments can be like super bizarre, like the number of sunspots visible on the sun. Um, which meets the exclusion principle there, like sunspots does not cause earnings. Um, but you also have to tell the story of sunspots causes education, which then causes earnings, which probably not. Um, but again, you can kind of just throw in a bunch of instruments and see what happens. Theoretically, you should make sure that all of your instruments are connected to a DAG. Um, don't just throw in random stuff. Don't throw in like Scrabble scores here because there's no plausible connection between Scrabble scores and education and earnings. That only works in specific situations. So don't go wild with instruments, um, but you can use multiple if you want. Um, and then finally, you can also use other control variables. Um, so you have to, like if you want to control for socioeconomic status or location or year, um, you can still control for things, but for a whole bunch of mathy reasons, um, if you press P on the on the slide right here to look at the presenter view, I have a bunch of links that show kind of the math why you need to include them in both. Um, basically, you have to include these control variables in both stages. So in the first stage, you have your instruments, and you also have control variables. And then the second stage, you have predicted education or education hat, which is the the exogenous part of education, but then you also have to include the same control variables. Um, and there's math reasons for that, but if you just remember that when you're controlling for stuff, it goes in both stages, you'll be fine. Um, so finally, doing this whole two-stage least squares regression is neat, um, where you run a first stage, predict um, the predicted policy, and then use the predicted policy to look at the outcome. Um, kind of the mechanics of that is neat, but it's really time consuming. Um, I have you do it in the problem set just so you can get used to doing it. Um, but this is the only time I'm going to have you do it. When you do other, I'll have you do other instrumental variable stuff in future problem sets. You don't need to do this. Um, you don't have to make the first stage first, predict, and then use the predictions. That's really tedious. 
Um, but knowing the mechanics is important, so you're still going to do it. Um, but in real life, you're not going to want to do that because first, your standard errors, um, which influence the significance of the coefficients, they will be wrong if you do first stage, make the predictions, and then second stage. Um, you can get them right. You just have to do some fancy math to the standard errors to adjust them for the first and second stage idea. Um, and I don't know that math. You can look it up in textbooks and figure it out, but you don't want to do that. Um, so instead of doing it all by hand, you can use our packages that will do both stages for you and do the correct standard errors for you um, that make life just a lot easier. Um, there are different packages that let you do this. Um, there's one package called IV reg. If you install that uh, through our studio, you have the IV reg function. Um, and the formula for it looks kind of like the fixed effects OLS um, regression models that you did for problem set five, um, where you have your outcome is explained by the second stage stuff. And then you use this up and down symbol or a pipe. And then everything on this part is stuff that's in the first stage. Um, so if you look here, there's this model IV reg. We're going to use IV regs. So we're going to say wage is explained by education. And then our instrument is father's education. There's no education hat here. It does the hat thing for you behind the scenes. You can't see it, um, but it's doing all of that for you, um, which is magic. And so if you just say IV reg wage is explained by education, but use father's education as an instrument, then look at the estimate, $7.83 which is the same number we got by doing the really tedious by hand thing. Um, it also gives you some, if you run summary on model IV reg, it'll give you some diagnostic tests. It doesn't show you the F statistic. You still have to run the first stage by itself to see the F statistic, but it does give you this weak instruments test, which is kind of like the F statistic, where if this is not significant, then that's going to be a sign that your instrument is weak. Um, if it is significant, like this is, tiny, way less, like less than 0. 0.00001, which is a sign that you don't really have weak instruments, that father's education is probably a good relevant instrument. Um, you can also use this function here called IV robust. Um, I actually like using this one better, um, mostly because it lets you do clustered standard errors and other fancy standard error things. Um, it has the same syntax where you say um, outcome is explained by second stage stuff and then you have your first stage stuff on the other side of this little bar here. So you say IV robust, wage is explained by education, but use father's education as an instrument. And if you look at the results here, $7.83, which is the same as we found before. Neat. Um, there's a package called um, FELM, which means fixed effects linear models. And there's an LFE function there for a linear fixed effects model. It, this is kind of like the, the FEOLS function that you use where it does really fast fixed effects. So if you're doing something like the uh, terrorist attacks in Argentina idea, where you have like hundreds and hundreds of possible interaction terms, and that's going to slow down the model and make it so it takes like multiple minutes to run instead of half a second. Um, this basically lets you do instrumental variables plus the fancy fixed effects stuff. Um, the syntax is a little bit different because notice here, this is what we were doing for fixed effects. Like these, this is where we said like block and year or state and or country and year, whatever fixed effects we're doing. Um, so that doesn't quite work here. So they have a, a different way of, of specifying the fixed effects and the instrument. So just look at the documentation there if you're ever interested. Um, but really, like IV robust is going to be the easiest way to run instrumental variables. You just say your first, second stage stuff, stick your instruments there. Um, if you're controlling for stuff, you control for stuff on both sides. And so if you had like an SES um, variable, you'd say education plus SES. And then over here, it'd be father's education plus SES. You repeat it on both sides. Um, so that's how you do it. How do they compare? Um, so if we look at all of these models simultaneously, um, this is the unadjusted wrong correlation is not causation model. Um, if we adjust for ability, which we can't because we don't actually have that column in real life, this is the forbidden model. That's kind of the true causal effect here. This is the um, two stage least squares model that we did by hand where we did a first stage model, used that to create education hat, and then used that to predict wages. Um, there's our 783 um, or 7835. Um, 
This is using IV reg and this is using IV robust. It's the same number, 7835, but the standard error is different. Notice how here it's 0.755, here it's 0.683, here it's 0.664. Um, that these are more accurate here. This is wrong um, because this was not adjusted by hand. Um, with whatever fancy math you do to fix that, but these have the, the correct standard, standard errors built in, and so those work better. You can actually see that also with the R squared. Um, the by hand version, the R squared is tiny, um, but if you do the, the official fancy ways that do it all for you, the R squared is better um, because they do all sorts of other adjustments to make it so the R squared fits the model. Um, so. In real life, you're not going to do this two-stage stuff by hand because it's tedious and you'll get wrong diagnostic information like standard errors and R squareds. Um, so in real life, you should use something like IV reg or IV robust. Um, but to get a handle on the process of doing um, two-stage least squares, I will give you practice where you'll run a first stage model, generate the predicted um, policy variable, and then use that predicted policy variable to explain the outcome. Um, so the general process for instrumental variables um, follows these steps here. First, you want to make sure the instrument is relevant, um, which you do by um, basically seeing if the instrument is correlated with the program. This is your first stage, um, and you want to see if the F statistic is big. Um, basically, that's you can do it all statistically. Second, you want to make sure the instrument meets the exclusion assumption, that it only causes the outcome through the policy. Um, and good luck with that, because most instruments fall apart here. Um, then you want to check if the instrument is exogenous, if there are no other nodes coming into it in the DAG. And again, good luck with that. Um, lots of instruments fall apart here. And then finally, you do two-stage least squares regression if the instrument's good. And you can either do that by doing the first stage where you say program is explained by instrument, and then outcome is explained by predicted program, which is conceptually what's happening behind the scenes, but it's miserable. Or you can just do, some, just do something like IV robust, and that will do it all for you. So that is how you actually run instrumental variables. Um, if you go to the um, examples page for instrumental variables, you can see kind of a heavily annotated version of how to do this. And there's a video of me um, coding it live. Um, so go ahead and head over there to see how it works um, in practice.